Welcome to Coming Home, Survive and Thrive in Homeschooling. I am posting book recommendations on my Twitter link. Some are from our own family collections. Others are collected from my approved assessments via lists and personal recommendations from others. Have I ever told you I find decluttering easy, with the exception of books? I used to let a few books go if I could get them from a library or a digital version. When book cancellations started over the last few years, I regretted letting some go and was relieved my reticence to declutter books got the better of me. I'm very, very careful before moving books on. One of my goals when I started this podcast almost two years ago was to review books for you. I have done surprisingly few. To rectify this, I am posting on X or Twitter one good book at a time and with regular podcasts to come, committed to reviewing and recommending good books. After all, good books are the foundation of great learning and you know I'm always going on about the importance of them. Recently, my husband and I started to watch the latest version of All Creatures Great and Small. I was aware there was an updated series, but prejudged it as being woke and messed with. Going from the trajectory of TV over recent years, I'm sure you'll forgive me for passing this series by until now. It's well done, actually. There's the smallest edition of Mixed Marriage and Their Social Difficulties, but that would have been so in the 1930s. However, I don't recall this in Harriet's books and don't think it necessary to include it just to make a point. There is a little modernization in the script, but for the most part, I'm relieved to say the studios have done a good job. The series stays reasonably close to James Herriot's books, but it's more correct to say based on. However, I'm still going to say read the books to your children before you watch the series, or at least, if you find it hard to wait, read as far in the books as series one goes and then go back to the books. Reading the original narrative gives a deeper, broader and more accurate understanding of the intention of the author. It's important for children to use their imagination to form the images of the stories in their minds before someone else's interpretation does it for them. It is a version of learning how to think and not what to think. I cannot stress how important this is. This is why having a broad range of vocabulary is an imperative task for the homeschooling family. Choosing living books, and you know I have mentioned them before, such as these teaches your children new phrases, old-fashioned but still important words. It will stretch their descriptive boundaries and equip them with colourful, precise adjectives. It teaches through the pleasure of a well-written book. It is the same reason why I recommend books from early reading ability and on with minimal illustrations for children. I do love a beautiful book and did buy some but they were secondary to the editions that had few pictures. If you need to have a book with pictures constantly telling or explaining the story for your child, this is a possible sign that the narrative is poorly written. We have both cheap paperbacks of his series and a beautiful book with a selection for children, beautifully illustrated. James Herriot, his real name is Elf White, is a clever storyteller bringing to life the history of veterinary care and the history of the time he lived in Yorkshire. I fell into the series and introduced them to our children when our youngest was born. I regularly prolonged her feeding times, quietly tucked up on my bed to read just one more chapter, 
when my baby was long fed, burped and sound asleep. His writing drew me into the sometimes severe and simple lives the farmers in the Dales lived. Many houses with no power, running water if you were lucky, and extremely hard workers. They made most of their few items of clothing, grew, raised and cooked almost everything they ate, and set in the 1930s through the Second World War and beyond, it was less than 100 years before our comparatively modern and pampered life. Reading and watching stories like this, based on real history, reminds me of how far we've come, but also how much we've lost. Many of the skills necessary to survive for millennia are really practiced in the modern life, and many are at risk of being lost. My treasured activity of knitting is done because I want to, and I get a lot of pleasure from it, but I don't need to knit to clothe my family. It is more important than what you and I realize that old skills and crafts are kept and passed on. If there is nothing else you get from reading All Creatures Great and Small, please implement the learning of age-old life skills in your homeschooling life. So why else is reading James Herriot a good idea? The aforementioned pre- and post-war differences. His stories start from a pre-war perspective, when medicines and tools were still fairly rudimentary, and they carry on through the Second World War and after that with the coming of more modern medicines, antibiotics and modernised equipment, which revolutionised veterinary care, as it did to human health. So it's fascinating to read his stories along a historical line as history at that time was being made with developments and progress. There's also the ancestry part of it. Many people in New Zealand have direct English, Irish, Scottish ancestry. James Herriot, or Elf White, comes from Glasgow. So that gave me a little bit of interest. I also have family that comes from Scotland. But more pertinently to these stories is my husband has ancestors that came from the same area. So to read these books and imagine that this is what life would have been like for his forebears only a few generations ago just helps raise the interest level and helps bring the story to life. To whet your appetite if you still need convincing that to read James Herriot's series is a good idea, I'm going to read you a little. Bonnie's Big Day Out One sunny morning in early September, I drove to see old John Skipton at Dale Close Farm since he had telephoned to say that one of his cart horses was lame. As I got out of the car, the untidily dressed figure of the farmer came through the kitchen door of Dale Close. John always seemed to look like a scarecrow, and today was no different. He was wearing a tattered, buttonless coat, which was tied round his waist with string. His trousers were much too short, and as he hurried towards me, I could see that he was wearing socks of different colours. One was red, and the other blue. By working very hard when he was a young man, Mr Skipton had saved enough money to buy his own farm with its handsome stone house. He had never married, and because he was always so busy looking after the sheep and cows on the hill, bringing in the harvest from the fields, and picking up the apples in the orchard, he had been much too busy to worry about himself, which is why he always dressed in such very old clothes. The horses are down by the river, he said in his usual gruff manner. We'll have to go down there. He seized a pitchfork and stabbed it into a big pile of hay, which he then hoisted onto his shoulder. I pulled my large gladstone bag from the car and set off behind him. It was difficult to keep up with the farmer's brisk pace, even though he must have been fifty years older than me. I was glad when we reached the bottom of the hill because the bag was heavy and I was getting rather hot. I saw the two horses standing in the shallows of the pebbly river. They were nose to tail and were rubbing their chins gently along each other's backs. Beyond them, 
a carpet of green turf ran up to a high sheltered ridge, while all around clumps of oak and beech blazed in the autumn sunshine. They're in a nice place, Mr Skipton, I said. Aye, they can keep cool in the hot weather, and they've got the barn when the winter comes. At the sound of his voice, the two big horses came trotting up from uh, the river, the grey one first, and the chestnut following a little more slowly and limping slightly. They were fine big cart horses, but I could see they were old from the sprinkling of white hairs on their faces. Despite their age, however, they pranced around old John, stamping their enormous feet, throwing their heads about, and pushing the farmer's cap over his eyes with their muzzles. Get over! Leave off! he cried. He pulled at the grey horse's forelock. This is Bonnie. She's well over twenty years old. Then he ran his hand down the front leg of the chestnut. And this is Dolly. She's nearly thirty now, and not one day's sickness until now. When did they last do any work? I asked. Oh, about twelve years ago, I reckon, the farmer replied. I stared at him in amazement. Twelve years? Have they been down here all that time? Aye, just playing about down here. They've earned their retirement. For a few seconds he stood silent, shoulders hunched, hands deep in the pockets of his tattered coat. They worked very hard when I had to struggle to get this farm going, he murmured, and I knew he was thinking of the long years those horses had pulled the plough, drawn the hay and harvest wagons, and had done all the hard work which the tractors now do. The story goes on and it really is quite lovely, but I think you would already have noticed that the descriptions that James Herriot used just sets your mind up and you can see the old man coming out of his house. You can draw a picture of his tattered clothes and his different coloured socks and you can see that the hills rising beyond and what kinds of trees were there and then the story of the old horses. And peppered throughout the story that he's telling, you can see evidence of a time that is no longer. That also gives me the thought that to have your children draw what they're hearing would be an added bonus to be able to read a story out loud to them. Now going on to the second book I'd like to recommend, and it is Whatever Happened to Penny Candy by Richard J. Maybury. It was recommended by Chris McIntosh from Capital Exploits. I interviewed Chris in a podcast a couple of weeks ago, and I strongly suggest you listen to it. In the interview, I asked him which books he'd recommend to homeschooling families. This was one of them. When a man such as Chris recommends a particular book, I take notice. I promptly ordered it from the library, and I understand why he says to make this book one of the priorities for understanding the history and the world of money. Here's an excerpt from the book. The author has written this book from the perspective of an uncle writing to his nephew to explain different concepts to him. Chapter 1. Money, Coins and Paper Dear Chris, in your last letter, you asked me to explain inflation and recession. You said newspapers have been discussing these things and you don't understand what it's all about. Don't feel alone. Inflation and recession are things most people complain about but few understand. They know their careers, businesses and investments are affected profoundly every day but they don't know exactly how. Even teachers, newsmen and politicians are often confused. They know these things are dangerous, but they can't figure out where it all came from or where it's all going. I'll do my best to explain as clearly as possible. You'll not only learn some important things about your future, but you'll be able to tell others about theirs. You'll also be much better able to become successful in whatever career, business or investments you choose. And you'll be much better able to stay successful. You'll know the hazards that are out there waiting to ambush you. As they say, forewarned is forearmed. Before you can understand inflation and recession, you must understand money. So don't read any further until you get a penny, nickel, dime, quarter, half dollar and a dollar bill. 
Lay them in front of you and look at them carefully. Notice the penny and nickel have no grooves on the edges like the other coins do. Those grooves are called reading, and believe it or not, they pay a part in inflation and recession. Next, look at the edges of the readed coins. Notice there is copper sandwiched between a nickel-zinc metal. These are called clad coins because the copper and zinc nickel are clad together. Before 1965, these coins were not clad. They were made entirely of 900 fine silver. That's silver, which is 90% pure. The other 10% is some base, not precious, metal, which was added to make the coin hard. You'll notice none of your dimes, quarters or halves are dated before 1965. That's because of inflation and recession, and I'll explain it later. Also, something you probably didn't know is that none of the coins you are looking at are really coins. They are tokens. A coin is a disc of precious metal, like gold or silver. If the disc contains no precious metal, it is a token. However, I'll call them coins because that's what you are used to. Now look at the dollar bill. Notice just above Washington's picture it says Federal Reserve Note. Years ago this said Silver Certificate and I'll be explaining why it was changed to its present form. Now look to the left of Washington and notice. This note is legal tender for all debts public and private. Remember legal tender. It's important and I'll be explaining why. All the things you've just observed are directly connected to inflation and recession. In my next letter, I'll begin explaining how. First, I'll tell you about inflation, then recession. I'll cover lots of different ideas, and then I'll tie them all together in my final letters. Uncle Eric I think the ability of an author to take a complex subject and Put it in a way that is simply put without dumbing it down is a special skill and I can see why Chris recommended these books. Unfortunately, they're not available in an audible form, but I'm thinking I might ask permission to read the entire book and make it an audiobook available to my listeners. I'm going to make other podcasts on book reviews. I'll include books that have earned the title of living or whole books, which you have heard me refer to before, which is the definition of a worthy book from the Charlotte Mason educational approach. From preschool, early readers and confident readers, all the way to classics for high school, as well as books to encourage and equip the parents, which I acknowledge is mostly the mother. Until next week. Happy reading.